This town, this whole settlement is one of the biggest and most elaborate ones I have shown you to date, my fellow going medieval fans. And on top of all that, it is also roleplay heavy with many amazing elements. You will see it all here, from a bandit's camp and a caved in crypt, lumber and windmills, to gallows and a brotherhood of thieves guild hideout. My name is Peter and the player who created this wonder goes by Lord Korka and he even has a backstory for this magnificent settlement he called Koenigsberg. Before I go into it, do know I have a dozen other showcases you can watch by using the playlist link up here and in the description. Now about that story to go along with these amazing visuals. A tired crusader called Friedrich returns to his hometown. There, he realizes the ineptitude of the local administrator, finds the treasury empty, no proper guards, outer villages ruined and pagans from Scandinavia and Kiev Rus raiding the rest. Friedrich steps in and decides to rebuild everything and restore his hometown to former glory. And here is the result of his work. The center of the map is dominated by the main town with a high curtain wall. To the south is a major mine where mainly iron but also some coal and rare metals are extracted. The south road is watched by the bandits from their newly constructed outpost as they have been drawn in by the settlement's restored prosperity. Close by are the ruins of the old village which the previous administrator let be ransacked one too many times. To the east we have a lumber mill of sorts as best approximated with in-game objects. At the north side of the map, a castle overlooks and when needed defends the farming village which supports the mine. This is where you can see the actual windmills if you use a bit of imagination considering the limited square objects design this player had to work with. Another village is also close by, quite self-sufficient and walled off. The two most ingenious projects on this map are the underground ones. The ancient crypt looks like a Diablo dungeon but whose entrance is basically walled off. The second place is straight out of an Elder Scrolls game as we have an underground hideout below the main town fit for a Brotherhood of Thieves guild branch. And we might as well start the in-depth look here as soon as we clear one thing about the in-game played hours in the history screen. Because Lord Korka changed some data in configuration files to prevent bandits from leveling his building progress with mass trebuchets, the clock is all messed up and shows far less time spent in-game than he actually spent building all of this, which is close to 150 hours. I guess starting on a hard difficulty in the survival mode ended up being the wrong choice for our inspired builder. While we are here, you can see that over a thousand days have gone past, hundreds of raids and thousands of raiders. Settlers count has stagnated for a while at 21 and now again at 23. This of course could have been avoided had he started in the peaceful mode, but then again he would have missed out on all the fun defending it from raiders. I honestly wish we could have a game mode in which we import our map, settlement and townsfolk and pit them against waves of raiders. It would make for fantastic fun. But back to the fantasy role-playing elements and the marvelous Brotherhood of Thieves guild hideout. It can be accessed through several entrances. First one is the hardest one to find, even with the free camera mode it was hard for me to find the path which takes you through a long ditch full of stakes and ends in a gated door and lots of traps. Many levels down the multiple staircase there are even more traps and dead ends. The one path dotted with role-playing foot traps brings us to the actual hideout. It is made out of wood and I personally found this quite fitting as these thieves prefer a nice cozy interior. There are multiple rooms, places to trade, sit around the fire, play games, fix gear and of course sleep and hide your loot on two levels. The vine room doubles for a wine cellar and the alternative path into the hideout. The local town distillery is right on top and it is one of the entrances and exit points for the thieves guild members. One room I missed in the first pass is the loot room where some gold, silver and other stolen stuff is located. 
The third way in and out is masked as sort of an ancient dig site or mine which exits to another small building inside the town. This kind of a mix of role-playing, fantasy and content from other games is another first for these player constructor showcases and I'm glad Lord Korka shared his creation with us. If you want me to show off your village or structure, send me the screenshots or even better, the save file at the email address in the description where links to my guides and let's plays can also be found. Now onto these windmills. Ok, ok, I know it's not directly obvious what the structure is, but considering how limited building items are, I think this player made as close an approximation to a windmill as he could. It is a simple two-story structure and the blades or sails are made of windows. You have to say it is an ingenious way to add some more role-playing elements using what's available in the vanilla game. More such ideas can be found at the lumber mill which is made up of one large and several smaller structures but the piles of logs are definitely the smartest design of it all. By changing their texture he made the vertical wooden walls look like horizontal cut logs. The main log cutting site is equally impressive and has just the right look created out of available elements. The ruined tower and bridge are right next door and these have been designed to look old and destroyed to match the backstory I told you in the intro. The mix of raw limestone walls and floors with the limestone block ones really nails that mix of old and broken parts of this bridge. Even the Marylands help to sell the whole idea. The same idea and materials were used to create the rundown mini village which is close to this bridge and tower. Some homes are more devastated than others, paths ruined, roofs collapsed, walls broken in. The church didn't fare much better. I think we should all invest in some sort of ruins next to our castle builds as these really add a high level of role playing value. Just like the ancient broken down fort did in that Lord of the Rings inspired mountain underground settlement I showcased a few episodes ago, molten lava channels included. Here is a link above and below if you have missed it. The folks from the destroyed village moved into a totally new one with better defenses and continued their lives behind stronger walls. The rebuilt village is also made of raw limestone and wood featuring many different homes mixed with workshops and game or drinking rooms. This time they have armed themselves better with armor and weapons plentiful and on standby at the gatehouses. Once again most of the walkways are paved with stone and even graves are dug inside leaving nothing for raiders to desecrate. The smithy, inn, temples, small homes with chimneys, a well all has been rebuilt here. The church even got an upgrade as it holds both religions shrines. This is where I found something unusual, a gold armor walled into the back of the church. I am not totally sure what it represents and instead of spinning several theories I will leave it up to you to tell me what you think happened here. Use your imagination and role playing ideas. In front of this walled village a lot of crop fields and even an apple orchard have been planted and fenced off. There is also a timber pile and they have their own windmill on the local hill. Now the castle and its soldiers which are supposed to take care of all the outlying villages, lumber mills, windmills, the mine and farms is located here on its own hill overlooking the map. It also serves to keep the main road safe and it's quite the beautiful fort on its own. I especially love the sky bridge connecting the main keep and the tall tower. It has practically everything a defensive castle should have. Many traps, windows to pour hot oil from or throw rocks, double doors, double walls with Marylands on top, guard stations, a bailey, well to put out fires and provide fresh water, supplies of wood, thick walls and a huge keep. This one holds food, entertainment and religious objects covering many of the guards needs all at once. Outside is the local blacksmith station while the second level of the keep holds more guard quarters. The third level is for the captain and battle supplies under lock and key. Lots of armor, melee and range weapons ready to be used. I just hope someone oils them from time to time. <laughs> It is basically what many of us would envision a small defensive castle to be, almost movie level setup. What makes it unique is definitely the sky bridge I mentioned, a feature I have now seen a few times in these showcases but still too rare compared to how cool it is. If you don't have a sky bridge in your settlement 
you should build one today. The interior of the tower is made up of sleeping and storage rooms, while the bottom level hides an access tunnel which connects the castle with the main town. It is protected inside by a dozen layers of doors and traps spaced out every few tiles, leading all the way to one of the towers at the main gatehouses in town. This town itself is quite large and has many multi-story buildings which I will take you through one by one. The main keep is quite dominant over everything else and the mix of limestone blocks, clay roof tiles and wooden second levels on townhouses really makes this a beauty to behold. One of the most notable features is the motto of a Catholic knight order written with different floor tiles. Deus Vult means God wills it. This is directly tied into the backstory of this settlement I told you in the beginning of this overview, because its current leader is a returning crusader. You might have picked up another sign of this, considering the settlement's heraldry is a dark cross on a white background. If I line up the settlers for you in the square sort to call it, you can see how that heraldry design looks on their armor and shields. I am not sure all the armor and weapons fit the Crusader's time period, but I think Lord Korka did the best he could with the game objects and items at his disposal. You have probably noticed the spooky gallows behind these soldiers and the additional hair-raising detail of a stockpile with actual bones at its foot. While I did line up the soldiers in this configuration manually, I was sent the save file with them at their posts guarding entrances and paths around the town while well drafted. I can show you this as Lord Korka told me about this detail in his email, so once I waited about 15 minutes for this massive settlement to load, I could find them around the town at their posts like this. It might seem like an unimportant detail to some, but to a role-playing player like him, this is just pure gold. Another such major role-playing element of this settlement is the bandit outpost. In its own corner of the map, and next to an important settlement road, this half-built, half-ruined mini-fort holds the fictional bandits who prey on the merchants and straying settlers. There are a lot of traps around it, as well as a wooden palisade. The main mine for this town is just outside of it, and both its form and function look amazing. There is easy access to limestone, iron and even some coal, and many local stockpiles have already been filled. The added towers and even fences to keep settlers from falling into pits offer just enough role-playing elements to transform the simple gameplay element of mining for resources into a very lifelike example of medieval open pit mining. The second part of it with massive support beams looks a bit more fantasy than reality, but if I'm wrong on that count, you can definitely correct me in the comments. Homes are also available to miners right on top of the excavations, which benefits actual gameplay greatly as settlers can rest, play and pray locally. I think this is also the first time I have shown you a complete role-playing mine design in these showcases and it is something I immensely enjoy doing as each totally new idea we discover here adds to our inspiration for future settlements. The next element of this settlement is yet another such example an actual lost and walled off crypt full of loot and items worthy of being a Diablo or Elder Scrolls dungeon. It is located at its own corner of the map, but it's not hard to find because of the use of religious elements for decor. As I mentioned, it really is walled off, totally closed. Peeling off the layers, we get into a room which holds lots of silver and gold items, more religious elements as well, and floors made of clay bricks which shine because of the candlelight. Of course, realism says the oxygen would be used up quickly by flames and there would be no fire. But we are not here for realism, are we? And this is just the first room, we should explore the rest. Down again, through a narrow, well-lit corridor, a double door and a trap, we find the last resting place of someone important enough to bury them with an army's worth of weapons, armor and not to mention tons of gold. You definitely don't see this every day, but if you have constructed anything similar, be sure to share it in the comments below. Last stop before the main town, the large farming village. This place is partly walled off and partly not, with some homes and even workplaces like the windmill outside of the low walls. The main point of it is to provide food for the miners and it also features a large-scale cemetery. 
The mini rural church is outside the walls with a few small homes and storage areas and the beautiful extra touch of a herb garden. The coal mine is just next door, as well as another mini iron mine, each with sleeping quarters, some food and entertainment prepared for the miners. Beyond the role-playing aspect of it, this is a really smart design to have everything close to where settlers do a job, which takes them far from their regular place of eating, entertainment and sleep. The cemetery is well designed with even some red currant bushes, herbs and trees to give it a more natural look, while it features not only graves and crypts, but also places to burn the bodies and pray. It even has its own local well. Not sure why exactly, but Lord Korka could tell us in the comments. As for the village itself, the small homes have their signature chimneys, clay roofs, and the only medium-sized buildings here are the watchtower and the local inn. It also features the only basement in the village with minimal supplies. There is one interesting structure here with a small fenced-off area, which I will assume is for some animal due to its design and stockpile placement with a grave which might be a stand-in for a poo ditch? The other interesting detail is the fenced-off tree at the middle of the village, reminding me almost of the place Asterix and Obelix live in with that huge tree in the middle. Now that we have taken a full tour around the settlement and checked out its notable mini-settlements, castles and other sites, it's time to look at the town proper. There are two main entrances into the town, and both have bridges, gates and massive gatehouse towers flanking those gates. Traps are plentiful, with one entrance having the extra gatehouse on the start of the bridge. The design of the gatehouses is similar to what we have seen in the previous player construction showcases, with places for guards to rest, have fun, put down armor and weapons, eat, walk on to the battlements or shoot out the windows. The walls which span from these are actually two layers but hollow inside with a walkway on top. It can be traveled on to other towers along the walls, all the way around and into the other gatehouses. The massive keep is at one corner of the town and walls, which is not the usual design we have seen before. There is another sky bridge over here and it's really long, connecting two of the largest towers. The differently sized towers is another special feature of this keep and while it might be a bit hard to look them over because of it, it does make up for one of the most unique castle structures I have ever had the pleasure of showcasing to you. In front are the gallows I mentioned before, as well as a place for merchants to come by and sell their wares at the large square. There is also another inner wall dividing the town up into both functional and specific quarters. Going down the levels, you can see just how many different designs are used in the construction of the keep. The bottom level is where we discover many hidden places, like vaults for gold and silver, a tunnel which provides access to other parts of the town, a deep iron stockpile as well as a refined metal stockpile. You can directly see how these match up to the above layers in their function. Besides the mini gatehouses and double gates, the small details like this outhouse acting like a toilet and this structure here being sort of a stables really sells the whole medieval castle look and feel. The middle decoration looks like a fountain without water while the other side of the bailey is set aside for coal and ash deposits a blacksmith and an armorsmith and the furnaces for metal production in front of them. In the other corner is sort of a kitchen, which is an odd fit in the setup to tell you the truth. The first level of the key proper is filled with specialized rooms, but you can't get there directly from the bailey. You have to climb up to the first floor where the great hall slash audience chamber is located. From there, a staircase leads to the wine cellar while the other rooms on this first official level have staircases to other rooms on that ground level. Not the standard design to say the least. Another interesting thing is that the grand hall is actually spread across two levels. The second one offers game tables and open access held up by pillars and arches in the lower of the two levels. These kinds of double level rooms are showing up more and more often in my showcases but I must admit not having used them in my own games and it is something I will take away from here and adapt to my own future designs. The rest of the rooms, as I mentioned, are mostly specialized, some for entertainment, others for medicine making, food stores or weapon and armor storage, while below there are even dungeons with guard rooms. The butcher's table being here smells of more nefarious uses rather than animal skinning. 
I think this is the first dungeon I have ever seen anyone make which actually managed to give off the feeling of having a torture chamber. So bravo to Lord Korka for this level of roleplay. The room with the weapons and armor has a staircase going down into what looks like an abandoned clay mine, while above it we find another room with military equipment, and on that floor first shrines are located in the form of mini temples. Next door is the actual kitchen of the keep, while other parts of it are for rooms with simpler designs, mostly rest and relaxation with a war room created using armor stands, chairs, a cartography table and some chests. Next level offers a similar breakdown of rooms, each with its own slightly different design. It is actually not easy to keep building and furnishing different rooms level after level. Most players, and this is me included, will fall in the trap of making copy-pasted rooms which repeat in large builds. But here, aided by the differently sized four towers which make up the corners of this huge keep, this player managed to design many, sometimes only slightly, different rooms. They all help make this place look more like a real lived-in place rather than something made up and designed to specs. I approve wholeheartedly and it is a great example to you all on how to shake up your future or even current construction projects. Sure, the items used to fill the interior repeat like armor stands, cartography tables, regular tables and chairs, but with some ingenuity and good ideas you can make it look so much more unique. I do know the camera angle and the layer camera often stop us from enjoying the interior room design to its full extent. It's true it would be much better if I could have a camera which I could walk and look through the eyes of the settlers who live here. And it is a suggestion I will have to take to the developers because I think it would make first person showcases a thrilling thing for going medieval content. The last few tower levels have these sky bridge connections at some places and there is just so much room in this keep and its towers that the population of this settlement could be in the hundreds and still not feel crowded. I just love how much detail went into the construction of it all, the meticulous Maryland placement, the visual texture changes for the wall pillars themselves and additions of the circular ones as chimneys and the extra roof at the top of the structures. Now let's look at the tournament grounds. The design is more like the movies than actual history, but that won't stop me from admiring the two level audience stands complete with chairs and fences, all done in wood and sticks along with the jousting field. The other side is obviously for nobility, hence the better looking chairs and the actual roof for those rainy days. I am just not sure how the mini stables fit into the whole idea, especially since those would smell too high heaven being right under the nobility. I guess we now know who the gallows are for, the builder of these tables. Right alongside the tournament grounds is this quaint church which unexpectedly has a pyre at its tower, which is definitely not a combination of elements I have seen before. Points for originality. The rest of it is less unusual, with an old type of an altar, a cross made on the floor tiles and both kinds of shrines inside. That is an interesting thing to do, and so far a lot of the places of worship in this element seem to have this inclusive design rather than separating the two religions to individual buildings. The gardens around the church are handcrafted with every kind of detail from a stone path and choice of vegetation to mini fenced off graves and even a monument of sorts. Right across the street from the church are some smaller buildings including bedrooms and a distillery which if you remember from the beginning of the showcase is where the entrance slash exit of the thieves guild is located. The outside look of the next building is a classic medieval tavern, again more movie like than in reality but I love its half stone half wood design, especially because of the outside game tables and the extended upper floor over the ground floor's level. Mini homes are spread around the tavern and there is an extra well here which sports an ice making workstation. This player has added it for extra role playing points. The blacksmith's quarter of the town seems to be here as well with all the workstations and materials in close proximity and we even have a settler working at it right now to give us a live demonstration. When I zoom out you might actually notice some other details like the placement of trees, mini arches, sheds, chimneys, fenced off stockpiles and other such handcrafted individual pieces of this settlement which 
with the very lifelike home design give it such an awesome look. If I sound like I'm admiring this place a lot, that is because I am. I mean, just look at that shield and cross design worked into the ground with floor tiles in the front of the gate and this awesome bridge. So much care went into every tiny and large segment that this has become one of my top 5 favorite settlements I have ever showcased in this series. Here we have a beautifully organized barley farm and well with a herb garden around a small apothecary workshop. On the other side is an actual specialized workshop, this one for sewing leather and cloth. Its second floor offers more storage for raw materials, some finished clothing and rooms for settlers to sleep. Uh, again we have the mix of materials down and upstairs with every kind of block, brick and wood up to the roof and chimney. In fact all the buildings in this quarter are like that, with resting rooms or workshops upstairs constructed in wood and clay and ground floors made of limestone. These even feature very nice tunnels for paths on the ground level while upstairs sky bridges keeping the buildings continuously connected. There is lots of material stockpiled on the ground floors of some buildings, but the main storage is in the vast basements. These are huge multi-layer underground chambers filled to the brim with every food supply there is, from meat and barley to herbs and honey. There is ice of course to lower the temperature and shelves are tightly packed with most keeping to the two rows rule, although a few have three rows which will work only until the developers stop settlers from moving through shelves. It is an impressive site nonetheless with such a huge centralized food basement, but as you remember we have seen small taverns, inns and great halls dotted around the settlement with usually packaged food so it doesn't rot in that warm environment. Up above again another large kitchen and a block and brick workshop and the line of downstairs workshops with flags grown next to the sewing workshop we noted earlier. Moving all the way to the walls we find a complete cemetery with several small and large crypts next to a major cathedral like building. This one is the largest religious building in this whole settlement and the materials of choice are limestone blocks, clay roof and floor tiles with odd bits of wood and sticks at some places. The major stockpile of silver at the top of the tower is to represent the clergy's wealth, power and influence, in the same way this library is supposed to show their accumulated knowledge. We are even lucky to find a settler here working on another book tome. It takes quite a while to drop the main library levels to reach the ground floor and the rest of the structure which is dedicated to shrines and prayer. Pillars, arches, flags, candles, floor tile cross, chairs, religious wall decoration, very high ceiling, it's all here, completing the huge cathedral like design. But the game tables? Those are totally unexpected. I'm not sure why they were included or perhaps they are a stand in for some other object this player could not find another lookalike. There are even more of them here on the second level edges while the central part is the high open ceiling. The roof has a simple and elegant design and the materials used are the same on the nearby buildings which look to be part of the religious quarter. There is this covered scap area with lots of bushes and fruit bearing trees for the role playing bees to collect nectar from, a well for the also imaginary water as well as the stockpiles for the much more solid and real beeswax. The honey is used up in this main building which is for meat brewing and storage with mini homes built in almost like cells for monks. Next door are more kilns and supplies while the main structure's second floor holds just a few more shrines. Outside is this nicely decorated main road with merchant stalls and caravan halts as well as the main square we saw before. As I said in the beginning of this player construction showcase, this is one of the biggest and most elaborate settlements I have ever shown you. But there is always something bigger, more complex and even more beautiful are right around the corner. Sit tight and send in your own settlements for me to showcase because we are just getting started. Thank you for watching and happy gaming.